Welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, good afternoon for those of you in Europe and uh, for those of you in, in China and good morning for everyone in, in Europe. So um, my name is Javier Baud and I'm very pleased to be the moderator of today's uh, webinar, the USME Center. Today's topic is how to apply lean principles to China, to your China business and practical advice for European SMEs. And today is the session two. So before we had a session one, and today we also have the same speaker. But uh, before we start with the webinar, let me introduce you the, the USME Center for those of you who doesn't, uh, are, are not familiar with us. So the USME Center is a European Union Commission funded project that helped European small and medium enterprises to prepare for doing business in China. We provide a range of services uh, from information, advice, training and other support uh, services. Actually, the USME Center is implemented by a consortium of six partners. Uh, you can have a look at the logos of our partners. And it was established in October 2010. We finished the first phase uh, last year, and we are entering the second phase, which will run until 2018. The six implementing partners are the China Britain Business Council, the Chamber of Commerce of France, in China, Bencham, Benelux Chamber of Commerce in China, Eurochamps in Europe and also the China Italian Chamber of Commerce and the European Union Chamber of Commerce in China. And actually today um, webinar it's, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be done in partnership with the uh, China Italy Chamber of Commerce. So uh, going ahead with the webinar we want you to be familiar with the platform so you can see a console in your screen and you can see this uh, rectangle where you can ask uh, questions during the webinar and we will have at the end of it, we will have a Q&A session. But you en we encourage you to send us a, a questions during the, the webinar and we will try to, to uh, answer them at the end. So uh, today's speaker is uh, Mr. Timo Shiman. Uh, he was the speaker at the, at the part one. And so some of you will be familiar with him, but uh, for those of you who aren't, uh, well, I actually would like uh, Timo to, uh, to introduce himself and, and talk us a little bit about what he's doing, and then we can go on with the, with the webinar. So uh, very welcome, yeah. Timo. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Yeah. Then I say a few words about myself. I'm working for Staufen, that is a German medium-sized consulting company is worldwide around 200 people and 35 to 40 of these are in China. Our main customers are the people that are listening to this webinar right now also. German small medium-sized enterprise from automotive, technology, electronics. We have Italian customers as well. We also have an office actually in Italy. We have an office in Poland and an office in Brazil. So we are, well, yeah working in the South American market as well. The branch has been established in China 10 years ago. In Germany the company is 20 years old. And uh, next to the consulting services, that's the only thing I want to mention, Staufen also invests into companies and applies its own principles over there. So we became the shareholder of four companies in Germany with a combined 485 people and 100 million euro revenue. And in these companies, we apply what we also offer as a consulting service. The reason behind this is that we believe that it works. Regarding my own history, a few facts. Until today, I worked in 31 assignments, so just 31 different clients. And uh, every project is focused on improving something. So in each of these assignments, there was either a productivity improvement or a space saving or a lead time reduction or a capacity increase. The things that lean people uh, think about every day, how to increase the performance of a system, of a machine, of a workplace, or of a whole factory. Yeah, That's, in a nutshell, shortly, my history. And uh, yeah. yeah, thank you very much, uh, Timo. Actually, well, it's very clear that you have a lot of expertise, but I, I can also realize that you have a passion about this uh, topic. So I think we're, we're very, it's very good to have you here today. And uh, so I think it's a good idea if we review the statements you made in the session one. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah. yeah. To get the link, 
from the session one to the session two, you know, the headline is how to apply lean principles to your China business and the session one was more about the lean basics and the session one is more, the session two is more about the China specifics. So as a summary of the session one basics of lean, you can say the purpose of it is to improve the performance in quality, cost, delivery, safety, morale. To morale you can also say commitment, QCDSM. Then another message from the first session. You don't have to start in production. That is the classic way of lean. It's still working fine, but when you see your R&D is really uh, taking too long for product development and the products are not good, you can also start with lean development. That's one key message and one big change in approach compared to the past. Um, the third point is uh, what works in China and what doesn't. First, all lean principles work. There is no difference. The logic behind or the logic within is the same all over the world. And when you want to apply lean principles in China about the technical part, you don't need to worry. But what you need to worry about is the uh, yeah, company culture or the culture that you want to create. And it's also important to know it's not there's no obstacle in China to apply lean principles because of culture. The only obstacle that can be there is when the company culture is not fit and this isn't something you need to work on. So uh, until today I think no one has discovered any country yet where lean doesn't work. It has been exported uh, to or imported or spread all over the world and wherever it's applied in a proper way it also works. The fourth point is uh, to yeah, work in the daily session, uh, understand the setting and then work with it. As a, re as a little reminder, I put in there the abbreviation three C's, culture, context, confrontation. So things are going to work different in China. You have to be aware of this and work with it, not against it. Confront yourself about what is the situation now and the last time I also said something, always remember this sentence, what is the right thing to do in this situation? Don't say in Germany or Italy or Brazil or Spain we did this and that, yeah. <laughs> but say what is the right thing to do in this situation. Then for the, for the last point which is also leading to the second webinar. The leadership part, the culture part, the behavior and mindset part is very important to get lean going and uh, we talked briefly about the three R's which we will go into more detail in this webinar and I put in there the sentence as a, uh, yeah, as a thought starter, leadership is or is not difficult. You can have both, uh, yeah, you can have both um, opinions about this topic. My opinion currently is leadership is not difficult. There's too much talking around it. Actually, leadership is showing your subordinate in the eye, talking with him about the task at hand and guiding through the improvement. And how can you do this? One simple thing is show a sincere interest in the work of your subordinate. Don't only meet them for the results presentation. See how they do it. Look at the train of thoughts, so what is going on in their heads. Don't only check the results and say good, not good. Yeah. Try to find out what made them do this or this. Yeah. While doing this, you will have a lot of conversations with your subordinate. This is building the connection. This is, uh, yeah. Uh, show of leadership and when people see that their work is appreciated, they will also appreciate you as a leader and respect you as a leader. Okay, there's another sentence in it. Only then you can detect flaws and guide to correct. Very important lean thought. If you only always check the outcome, you have no way to find out whether some deeper flaw has caused this outcome. So. Look at how the work is done, see what are the steps to get to the result and then you can guide to 
make the proper steps to get the result that you want. Here is another side of this medal, which is often made wrong, the micromanagement. You should not micromanage, so you do not do the work of your subordinate. You watch closely and guide to the next step, but you do not take away the work from your subordinate. That is a very big leadership mistake, which is often made. Yeah, And you shouldn't do it. That was the summary from the session one. And with this, we want to go into the session two also and talk now yeah, yes, more yeah. about the China. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Timo, for this great summary about the first session. And yeah, I think what we also wanted to do is uh, we got some questions and answers from, from the first uh, session. So your idea was yeah. to uh, answer, answer these questions now in this, in this session. Right, right. There was uh, two questions, there were a number of questions, but two stood out. And the first one is, where is lean more difficult to implement, Europe or China? The second one, what are the main obstacles for implementing lean in a wholly foreign-owned company, in a joint venture, in a state-owned company, or in a China private-owned company? And we want to go through these uh, yeah, two questions first to address this. Uh, yeah, And I want to share my opinion on this. Of course, there may be other opinions, but from my experience here and my conclusion so far, this is what I will relay after the poll, because this is an interesting topic. We have made a poll out of it also. What do you, as an audience of this webinar, think? Where is it more difficult to implement, in Europe or in China? Yes, and then we, then we will go with the, with, the practical, the with the practical advice. I think this, this webinar is going to really try to focus uh, much more on that advice, uh, giving advice to the companies what they can do. But yeah, as you said, let's go with the, the first pool. Let's ask our participants uh, what they think. So um, mm -hmm. let's launch the pool. And yeah, you can see it now on your screen. Like uh, we asked the question to you, where is Lean more difficult to implement, Europe or China? So you have two, uh, two choices. And yeah, we will give a few seconds still to the participants to, uh, to vote. And then we will show yeah. the results and, and get the comments from, from Timo. All right. This, this is an interesting question, actually, because it leads to a broader understanding uh, about what is difficult when implementing Lean. Yeah. Um, so I'm yeah. closing the pool now, and I'm going to share the results with you. And this is something we talked before, and this, the result is as we, we expected. Like, people believe it's harder to... Um, to implement a lean strategies in, in China. So the, mm -hmm. the final result, mm -hmm. as you can see, is that 38% they believe Europe is more difficult, but 63% think, think it's China. All right, all right. Mm -hmm. So then let's have a look, or uh, let's have a look at this question and, um, yeah. Let's share my, my opinion on this. Uh, in a summary, I think it is more difficult in Europe. I have summarized this also here in this sentence. Why is that more difficult? Because there is more resistance to change in Europe. The challenge of lean implementation in China, it's not about the resistance, but it's about an education system that does not foster creativity, and or three possible answers, solutions to a given problem set. Yeah. This lean mindset, the lean mindset of repeating a never-ending questioning of existing procedures and ultimately of yourself, of oneself, with the purpose of finding better ways to do the work at hand. Today, the smaller part of people in Europe are pre-wired to do this. Everything is more settled in China as an emerging economy, as a newly industrialized nation, as already industrialized in certain areas, more people are yeah, open to this change. Here there's a twist. They are more open to the change, but they struggle with the, it's called the power of deduction. So the ability to grasp the whole situation and to draw conclusions from it. So. To weigh those two things, I would say it's more easy to implement lean in China, 
um, because the the education part and uh, to open the eye to understand the broad context this is something more easy to teach and the yeah resistance to change this is something very difficult to get out of how to say uh, a group of people yeah? when things have been done for the last 20 years in a certain fashion and naturally people are resistant to a change of yeah their work life a change of procedures so um, especially in Europe as a very very mature economy people are less open to change and uh, in China people are more open to change therefore I think it's easier to implement it in China like I said before that's from my observation there may be other observations and I want to add another thing here China is not China is not China there exists many Chinas yeah there exists the China around Shanghai the China around Beijing the China around Guangzhou the China in Wuhan this country is amazingly big and when you ask people from the south what they think about people from the north they have their opinion and when you ask people from the cities what they think about people from more inland they have their opinion and there exists a number of mindsets in China there is not that one mindset that makes your lean implementation difficult when you ask me where is it more difficult uh, or where, where is it more easy hmm. I would say in the areas or in the north in general, the people I find they are more more they are more aggressive, but they are also more um, more strong implementer. Yeah, <laughs> and um, I think there's yeah they are more embracing, but there, there can be other experiences as well. This is just a huge country, and we all make only let's say experiences out of very certain parts. So. Um, the trick is don't go in with a fixed mindset and uh, yeah, expect either way. It can be very hard, but it can also be very easy. From our projects, we have some companies where there's really a good management team and they are pulling in one direction and they have no problems with letting things go from the past. Then in other assignments, the yeah ability to let things go from the past is not so not so strong so we experience both both phenomenon and I would say in general I also worked a few years in Europe and had made lean projects and lean transformation actually over there and uh, there is an English word for this also it's called concrete heads so the <laughs> the number of the percentage of concrete heads in Europe is generally higher no? Of course, this is a general comment. This is never about the individual. Every individual can be different. So that's my take on the where's lean more difficult to implement in Thank Europe you. or in China. Thank you, Timo. So uh, yeah, let's let's go for the next question, which was mm -hmm. more more maybe difficult to answer. Yeah. So, but you you prepare right, a right. table, try to summarize all these concepts. So please go ahead. Right, right. And this is always the goal conflict to. Uh, distill the information to the very essence and I tried it with this table so we have a wholly foreign, wholly foreign owned company on the very left and I wanted to see okay the obstacles for implementing lean they they grow out of something and uh, yeah, starting point here is the main motivation to do lean and for woofies it's typically long-term growth they are more long-term oriented that is the European approach. We want to grow steadily but long term and that's our main motivation. Then what does it lead to? What is the typical mindset which at the same time is the main obstacles? Some people call it slow, some key people call it reasonable. Yeah. <laughs> so for the Wufi, yeah, headquarter decisions can take very long time to tickle through the organization. So in a Wufi, the main obstacle for implementing Lean is the time. Uh, that things may take very long time where you think it's easy. You can just, for example, take a purchasing procedure where some mm, yeah, 
uh, equipment has to be bought to set up your assembly line and this can take a very long time because uh, yeah, European companies are more bureaucratic, I would say, uh, than, for example, China private-owned companies. If in a private-owned company uh, you need a certain equipment for your assembly line, some fixture, then you just talk with the boss and he talks to the purchasing guys and it's there next week. When you are in a European run company, the, the yeah, path, oh, this, this takes uh, a month, yeah, the purchasing uh, procedure. So the main obstacle there is the time. And uh, what's the main obstacle for implementing lean of people? I made it there intentionally in this way. Uh, it is the same. Uh, people adapt this mindset and uh, yeah, uh, which is mm, in some instances an advantage and in others not. So let's go to the state-owned company. What do we have there? The main, main motivation to do lean. It's the knowledge transfer. They have the mindset of we want all and we want it yesterday. <laughs> this can be an advantage if yeah, you um, want to like, implement a whole system and not only parts of it, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But uh, the, the nature of things, how long things take, there is really a different understanding and to buy a lean implementation is not something you can buy from the supermarket off the shelf and it's there next week. Yeah. It's taking months and years to get this mindset into the company. So the obstacle there is the thoroughness. It's lacking the thoroughness. When you want all yesterday and next week already you want something else, something more new, then it's not thorough enough. For the joint venture, there the main motivation to do lean typically is headquarter strategy. It's quite similar to the Woofy, uh, except of the point that it becomes a, I call it here, soap opera. My dear joint ventures out there, I don't mean it in a bad way, I just speak it out how it is. There is a lot of politics involved because it's two parties which on paper are working both towards the same goal but in daily life are not. So in joint ventures you have to deal with a lot of politics uh, and you want to implement lean. There's one manager who wants to go left way, the other manager wants to go right way, and then there's a lot of negotiation and dancing involved. For the China private-owned company, this is actually the most, um, uh, hmm, I wouldn't say easy, but it's the most um, easy to understand setting. There is a boss who probably has started having not a lot of money, and he set up the company, and he did a lot of things right to get the company to where it is today. His main motivation is in the current setting or compared to Europe, uh, it's fast cash. In Europe, when you set up a company, maybe you can grow it over five years or in the case of Staufen, in 20 years, you can grow it to 200 people. In China, probably you grow it 200 people in half a year and then 1,000 people, two years, 2,000 people, three years, and in five years you have 10,000 people. So the growth of the company is much higher and the typical mindset there is return and invest. Uh, the thinking is pretty straight. Yeah. It's pretty businessman-like. Yeah. It's about return and invest. And there's less soap opera involved. It's typically going fast and it's more reasonable than a state-owned company. Yeah. So these are the obstacles you have to deal with in such companies or when you approach such companies uh, yeah, that uh, are happening. Wait a second, I need to go. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Timo. That, that was a very good uh, summary. And, uh, yeah. Okay, I'm back. Yeah. I'm back. Yeah. So, so here we have the... <laughs> yeah. So I was saying that that was a very good summary and, and yeah, I mean, they actually, like, we keep on with the, the presentation and, right, and I, I like this slide. I like, <laughs> I like this slide uh, and we were talking when, when rehearsing this presentation about, yeah, like, it's important to know about when, where, where you start from. 
and also it's important ah, to understand yeah. like the different kind of companies that are in China because we have yeah as, as we will see later on like there is there is big difference between some companies and others right so yeah please right. go ahead Timo. This is the beginner's class picture. You can see this in China, but you can also see there's a next picture coming, uh, first class factory. So the industry is not homogenous. No? There is industries which are very advanced and other industries are very not advanced. Yeah? It takes a while for the picture here to load. Uh, slowly it should come, the picture from the next page. This is one of our partners in Shanghai, DMG. They make machine tools and they are top notch. Yeah. You can eat from the floor. They have here electronic uh, work instructions. It's paperless. They have a flow line here. It's, uh, yeah, and you can see <laughs> the difference and it's also China. Both is China. It's both um, some basic in some areas and in other areas very advanced. Yeah. And depending on this context, uh, the the obstacles are, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's it's very in, in important to for the companies in Europe to understand that that there is there is very different realities in in China and that yeah you can find uh, many factories like like this, actually. Right, right. And that's we have to go through to the next uh, pages a bit faster, yeah, you know, because we want a 45 minutes talk and then the 15 minutes of uh, question and answer and here the first one because the headline of this talk is practical advice so here is a very practical advice also from our recent work we got a questionnaire from the European headquarter a lean questionnaire for participants of a training yeah? and this questionnaire had multiple choice parts in it and as you can see there there are some answers which are made in an ironic way like the 5Y method. What is it for? It's the perfect tool to release your stress and to upset your employees. This is irony, which is a concept which is quite, or it's not as the Europeans understand irony. For Europeans, they look at it, they smile, fine. For the participants here in the training, we, we, we modified this up front because my colleague was coming to me and asking me, Timo, what, what's about these answers? Is, is, is it serious or what are they about? And the, the concept of irony is, uh, yeah, different here. So <laughs> if you have irony in your written tests, people just start to discount the whole test to yeah, the validity of the whole test. So you cannot have irony in um, yeah, written tests. Here's another good example, zero defect strategy. Do not forget to blame your colleague for producing defective parts. People are not used to this type of irony. Um, we could go deeper into it, but not necessary. You just take it out. Yeah? <laughs> the understanding of humor and irony is just very different in Western world and in Asia, and this is a uh, yeah, number one indeed. example. It is irony, indeed, and, yeah, I think it's very practical advice. Yeah. Irony is something that is, yeah, I mean, it's the same when you make an ironic comment with your colleague or you talk about something, that there is uh, no access point yeah, to this kind of uh, humor. Then the second one, what we also have in our daily work uh, all the time, uh, is uh, how about the language? Should it be English? Should it be Chinese? Should it be bilingual? And after being 10 years here now, our standard is on every form which is used on the shop floor where people yeah, work with by hand. This one is bilingual, so here you can see the handwritten remarks. This is an OEE calculation tool and this is made by hand and this is bilingual because we always want all people to talk with each other and understand each other in a proper way. This we would do bilingual, then for presentations that is coming on the next page those we will, not we will, we are always doing in one language. So there is one version in Chinese and one version in English. This is for your presentations. When you put two languages on one page, it just becomes a mess. <laughs> and after a while, there is uh, no more blank space. So for forms, 
specifically on the shop floor, everything that is put on a board or that is worked with by hand, those are bilingual and the language of choice there is English. We have some clients that put some German also in it. Uh, if you ask us what language should you choose, we say you should choose English because then the Indonesian um, colleague can understand you and the colleague from Vietnam and from Cambodia, they can also understand you when they only read the yeah, Spanish and Chinese, then they may not understand it. So that's the, um, that's the standard. I would always go with it. Um, I have heard many discussions of people, oh, should we do this way, this way, and we say, do it this way, trust us, it's the least amount of effort. If you work this way, that's the least amount of effort that you put in your stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, I think that's, language and presentation. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's very, very valid comment. That based on your extensive experience here, and yeah, when you make a training, yeah, it should be like in one, one, one language. And but yeah, the, the forms that are used in the factory yeah, that's bilingual. That's a very good advice, in my opinion, too. So yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. You know. And then, right, we go to the point of uh, how to improve behavior and mindset. We talked about this a little bit in the last webinar, and I want to shortly summarize it here also, this practical advice. Yeah? We are not talking here about some high-flying stuff, but about practical advice. How can you, as a manager, work on improving the behavior and mindset of your people? First part is go to the real place which in a factory is a shop floor, or when you are in an office environment, it's the desk or the meeting room or wherever the real place is where the work takes place. You don't let people report to you about some remote phenomenon, but you go on site. The lower line of this uh, graphics, this is always how you should do it. The upper line is how you should not do it. You should not be far away. You should go to the place of work. The second thing is the real thing. When you discuss a quality issue, you can actually, after 10 seconds, already stop a discussion when you are talking about this in a meeting room. You say, let's not talk about it now. Let's go to the part. Let's see where is the actual defect. Yeah? This is much more efficient than explaining for 10 minutes that a hole should be in the top left corner and now it's in the lower right corner. Yeah? There is so much misunderstanding involved. Don't do it. Always go to the real part, look at the real drawings, see what's going on, the real thing. Third part is the real facts. Visualization, as you see here, is very important. The upper part with the boards and the numbers on it, very important. But you must never forget that these numbers only tell you a small slice of the reality. So on the right hand side, there's a number going down on this board and we always advise go on site to understand what is causing this number to go down. Yeah. Real facts is the thing. You must do both, the visualization and the confirmation on site. Not only putting the charts on the wall and people look at it and people understand exactly zero. Yeah. So whenever you see a strange movement of a number up or down, the first question is always how comes? How comes that this number is going down? How comes that it's going up? And then the second question is, let's go and see on site what's happening. And this is explained here with this graphic with the machine that is leaking some liquid. And, and Tim, also in, 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 in my opinion, that's even, even more important uh, in China due to the, the, the language barrier. Yeah. So uh, it's Absolutely. very important to be visual, you know, like my experience also with employees when you, you really make them see, you know, Absolutely. with their own eyes, it, it makes a big difference. Absolutely. And no one can ever be as elaborate to explain a technical phenomenon just by words. I have seen a lot of uh, Germans, now they are often not so fond of the English language, but technically they are very fond, so they have explained with hands, arms, with the part itself, and there was a great understanding yeah, between the two. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Sure, sure, I believe so, that. Yeah. To speak without words is better than with words. Yeah. Or to say something without words. Mm. That is here the 
This is, not, this is the advice. Now don't, you don't need to uh, dig deep into the psychology of uh, why are people this way and this way and this way. Just go to the real place, look at the real thing and yeah, understand the real facts of what is behind the fact. And then you will have a, uh, you can build the behavior in the direction that you want to. Here on the next page to have some picture about this, how does it look like in daily work. No? This is where the work should take place you are looking at the data on the left hand side and these are all our people and our pictures there most of these pictures I took by myself some are from the marketing the one on the left hand side is from our marketing but I want to point out this is our people on this picture it's not from some catalog or stock photo and on the right hand side you see the group of people looking at the real thing what's going on this is where the work takes place and this is where you can put your energy in to improve behavior and mindset yeah, so this is a good example of not just showing, but really showing how, how it is done. So, yeah. the real pictures. This is, this is a, there's, there's a nice picture we have also here in the middle, on the right hand side, the picture in the middle. To make your eye sensitive, yeah, there is a one important part missing of this board, which are the people in front. Yeah? The board without people in front is nothing. Yeah? People have to work with the data, understand it, when you have a visualization and people just look at it like briefly when they walk by on the way to lunch, it's, it's not, not proper. So another thing we always say, the, it's not about shop floor boarding, yeah? it's about shop floor management or it's, you can have another word for it also, it's working, working with the numbers yeah? and not putting the numbers up for the sake of putting them up. Okay, Timo, so at, at this point I actually okay. would like to interact again with the audience and we want to uh, make another poll. So actually we want to ask them, so how long does they, they, they think uh, it will take to achieve improvement in the, in the change in mindset and, and behavior? So um, let's talk about the timing and we give different options like three months, one year, two years and, and five years and of course we are aware there is no like a correct answer, but we just want to know your opinion and also and also understand what the what the audience when they the, their expectations what they are if they really expect this to happen very quickly or they they're seeing this as a very long term mission or goal. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And this is very general this question and mindset and behavior. No? This can be yeah. a small thing or can be a big thing. So I'm Therefore, gonna close yeah, the pool yeah. now and yeah and share mm -hmm. share the results uh, with you so uh, yeah I'm, I'm happy to see that yeah the audience understand in three months it's very difficult mm -hmm. to achieve uh, nothing you know but but you can see like most of the people they, they believe a good timeline will be like one year and then yeah a lot of that people is, also yeah. two years I would also I would also say between one and two two years, one and two, three years. We talked about this before, Javier and me, and this is really it is a difficult question, but when you generalize uh, enough, then you know, okay, it's, it's longer than three months, but definitely it's also less than 10 years. So we came up with these categories also, and yes, you can see after one or two years, and you can notice there is a different way to do things uh, in the daily work. Yeah. That is... Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks like for your comments. How can adult learning? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, here we have listed some example, a very easy example for example, discipline and starting on time. Yeah, having meetings start at the proper time and also finish at the right time. These are the things that you need to watch out for if you want to get a basic discipline into the company. Very simple and hard thing to do. Mm -hmm. It's it's both simple and hard. It's simple because it sounds so simple, but it's hard because it's hard to do, is to look for uh, punctuality. Yeah? If you want to get a discipline in, you need to start at the right time and finish at the right time. And this is here on this list. And the second part is you need to encourage teamwork. Here is the supervisor in, the process engineer, the maintenance guy, quality guy. When they see, when they stand together and discuss about how to solve the problem, then you have the right mindset. 
The opposite would be only the production guys meet and then they call for a meeting later with some other people involved and they call the next day with some other people involved and then after everybody is informed the whole week is gone. Yeah? You don't want this. You want it task oriented. There is the task and the functions group around the task to get it done. That's a big difference in behavior also. We, to get to this behavior we have put in here five points. Uh, we go through it briefly. Go see, understand, help. That relates to the three R. Teach the steps of the scientific method. That's a point about problem solving. That people not jump to conclusions but that they follow a step-by-step -step approach to solve problems. Uh, we won't go too deep into this. You just need to remember don't jump to conclusions. Yeah? <laughs> Start with a proper description of the problem first and then make a, it's called a hypothesis. So make a guess. If I change this, then this happens. It's about cause and effect. Cause and effect. And you need to fully understand cause and effect. Test until you find the root cause and then you have your solution. That's the scientific method. Third part is don't micromanage or jump past subordinates. That's about the leadership part. No? Work with your person. Do not walk past your yeah, subordinate. Then be rigorous until the root cause is solved. That relates to the second point. And too often people come to you and say, we have a solution. And when you look at it more detail, there is no solution. Yeah? It's just a fix. So be rigorous. Don't accept shortcuts. Fifth point is focus on the process. Good process make good results. That's the lean idea, the lean thinking. We are results and process oriented. Here we have some more points which are also meant as a thought starter and actually it's a list for you for every week starting today for the next six months you can pick one of these points and just one. Yeah, Don't pick five, just pick one of the points per week and observe your own behavior. How is it with respect to these points? Number one, the leaders want to understand what's going on. Hmm? That relates to you. Something, some work flies to you or is being taken to you by your subordinate and you want to understand what's going on behind the curtain. Then the second thing, you use a questioning technique to find out what's going on. The third one, you summarize after meetings. When meetings are over, you take one minute to summarize what has been decided and what are the next steps to do to get if you One remember, uh, Timo, I wanted, I, I was uh, inquiring about this. Uh, what are the questioning techniques? And if you could give us some specific examples, what do you think are the good question, the clever question that, that to ask in a general yes, way? Yes, yes. Right. There always. Uh, this is the this is the classic one. Uh, there is an old saying that says, "There are no stupid questions." Okay, I agree to this, but I want to add. There are no stupid questions, but there can be dumb questions. <laughs> and what I mean with dumb questions is when a superior, so a leader, is just asking a question which is going nowhere. Yeah? As a leader, you have the responsibility to ask a question which points towards a certain direction. Yeah? Not pointing into the blue, but point into a certain direction. This can be about material, for example, when there is a mis when there is a faulty part, then you can point to the direction what's going on with the material. Is the raw material in the right? Uh, yeah. Do we have a different lot from another supplier? Yeah. You can point towards geometry things. You can point towards mistakes which may happen at the machine. Yeah. So you have to put some thinking in as a leader. You cannot just ask, why is it broken? Why is it broken? Why is it broken? Yeah. This is <laughs> not the right way to do you should put some direction into your questions. Thank you, Timo. Yeah. yeah. And this is the questioning technique. Then this is also related to the first one. You create your own image of the situation. You go on site, see what's going on. The next one here, this is a very, very tough one. You are regarded as a stable individual from your colleagues, supervisor and subordinate. That means you have a goal in your head. You know what you want. You have principles. You are not changing your mind from one day to the next. Yeah. You are neither 
a slacker nor a yeah, shouter. You are stable. Right? You are determined. So that is meant with a stable individual. <laughs> okay, we had another point there. You follow through with comments. So uh, these comments again should point into a certain direction. We can yeah, go to the next. Last three we have there. Um, here's a point that's a bit more difficult. You create safe space for mistake learning. That means when people try or how to say practice the scientific method of experiment, a test and a confirmation, then this experiment must happen in a safe space. It must not bring your whole factory to a stop. Yeah. <laughs> you want your people to learn and the way of learning is to think about cause and effect and you want them to try certain ways. Try this and find out what's going on. Try this, find out what's going on. You create a space for this. Uh, hey, Timo, I was, about this. I, was, I was wondering, like in the Chinese culture, like the, the, the face uh, issue, like it's very hard for uh, the Chinese in general to uh, accept failure and to the losing face concept. So how, how do you reconcile this in, in this particular yeah. mindset? There is, in fact, this is a novelty, yes. <laughs> People uh, are very um, reluctant. The first thing is to talk about this in public. So the, the trick to get around this is when you have these conversations only it's for I principle. You with your subordinate alone. You if you do it in front of a big group, it won't happen. You will just hear some something, but you will not hear the truth. So uh, this um, safe space then relates to uh, you go with your person uh, on site, talk with him over there. Um, you shouldn't do it in front of a big committee, yeah, then the, the truth will not come out. So <laughs> privacy is there the, the way how to yeah, get through this. And then you can build a level of trust with your subordinate. And he understand that he if he is making a test and this test is going wrong that he will not rip off his head. That is the <laughs> um, that is the Thank you, thank you for your, your comment. That you're creating. There's another twist to it. Mm -hmm. There's another twist to it. You allow mistakes, but you also do not allow mistakes. That is the uh, difficult thing to understand in this context. Actually, you allow try and error, but if someone is making a mistake just because of uh, lack of concentration or lack of thoroughness, then this mistake must also be sanctioned. Yeah, so you should not say, oh, I'm happy that you have made this mistake, but you should be worried about this. and say this is not accepted. Mm -hmm. The leaders give and receive feedback and that's very obvious. The leaders do not micromanage. That is again such a point easy to read, difficult to do. But uh, yeah, when you just carry the sentence with yourself through your week and say, uh, when was the last time that I took away work from my subordinate? <laughs> and you just follow through the week and observe yourself and see uh, when did I take away a work and with this work a part of ownership from my subordinate? Then this should make you think and uh, learn from it and not do it again a second time. Mm, okay, we have Timo, yeah, so we have the last uh, pool for today. So I actually want to ask the, the audience where do they, they see the biggest improvement, improvement is needed in the implementing Lean. So we have the first answer, commitment to keep the promise, walk the talk, and then trueness, ability to fully grasp a situation, and finally the last option is ability to come up with original ideas. Mm. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's let uh, the audience uh, pick up an answer. We want to see and, that yeah. from the day work and from the... Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to close it now and share with you the results. And you can see, like, uh, yeah, there seems that there is a lack of commitment, but also wow. a lack of creativity, I would say. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah. That is interesting, as we always say. <laughs> that is uh, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought it would have been more on the on the middle part, uh, but uh, yeah, 
probably the upper and the lower answers. These are the things that are uh, more remembered. Yeah, and yeah, for the middle part, we must also not understand that this context thinking is uh, a very Asian habit, and um, they they can do it very well. But then to connect the dots, that's that's another thing where our experience is mm, it's not not so fine. This is also where the next pages are about. We have a very brief breakout session to deepen the understanding of the conflict resolution style. Now we always want to understand each other to yeah better work together. And the Western people, our society is in general, this is generalized and more centered around the individual. The Eastern is more centered around the place in society. And I have yeah, shown it here with these lines which are it's like gravity lines. Now they gravitate to the person. That's the idea of the Western guy. You know? And on the next page uh, it shows also what are the consequences of this thinking. Let's go to the, to the next page. Westerners in negotiations, they think in terms of reciprocity. So, I am softer here and harder there. Yeah? This is our conflict resolution style. We think that we can kind of bend the matrix. Yeah? We say, okay, here I make some, um, here I'm softer and in the other part I'm harder. For Eastern mindset, it's not this way, it's more a move within the matrix. So the conflict resolution for the Western guys, be he softer here, harder there. For the Asian guy, it's to move to a different square. And this is what makes you think that your negotiation partner is yeah difficult to to uh, understand. Yeah, because you understand in your Western way. And when you change your eyes to the to the Eastern mindset, we think about okay, what have he done right now? Where did he put his chess pieces on the chessboard, where did he move and this new position then gives a new context and this explains the behavior. This here is the breakout session uh, to deepen understanding uh, the, yeah, for the implementation of your lean principles because I'm sure you will have a situation where you just say why did my, why did my colleague, why did he just do this yeah? and you cannot understand it <laughs> and then this may help you understanding. The practical advice to uh, yeah, deal with it is to have the hands-on mentality. And this hands-on mentality has two parts. It's respectful and demanding. And the key element there is the end. Yeah? You cannot only be respectful and say, okay, okay, okay. You cannot always give in, give in, give in. Yeah? You must state your demands clear and you must work with and from. Or you work with your people and you expect certain results from your people. This is a leadership style, it's called cooperative leadership style and that works like a charm in China as well. You combine this together with the thinking about the matrix and it will deepen your understanding in your daily work. You feel much easier to yeah, yeah, we, get the results. We were discussing, uh, Timo, that the, in general it's difficult for the Chinese uh, employees to accept promises about the future. Uh, I don't know if you can this, yeah, elaborate a bit more on, on that. Right, right. This uh, is more of a concept of the West. This uh, yeah, reciprocity which has a timeline. Yeah, I always call it like this. There is also the reciprocity in China. Absolutely. When you have a business relationship, uh, there is give and get yeah, is in it. Yet the timeline for Westerners and yeah, compared to Chinese in this sense is much different. Yeah, for Westerners, uh, we want to invest here and we want to have a five-year long-term partnership with our joint venture partner. And for the joint venture partner, what is going on in five years, he absolutely doesn't care and also he has no idea because China is changing, China is changing so fast. So he has made the deal today because it's of a certain advantage today for both parties and in five years there's a completely new setting. There is there's no memory bank in this sense yeah, that you can build on. You have then in five years just look at the setting, what is the setting now and does it still make sense? And 
I, I think that that's very true, and that's really the why why it's like that. It's not that they don't care about the future, but it's like the speed of change in China is so high that sometimes the future is very very hard to foresee. And yeah, that might be one of the you reasons. You can also, yeah, you can also call it like this, right? There's just a speed of change here, which is, uh, yeah, something very new to us, and therefore, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is very alien to our. Our, yeah. So yeah, we're about it's to really finish the uh, demo, the so I would really appreciate uh, if you can do a final summary for us and then maybe we'll have uh, time for one or two questions. Right, okay. We have done, we have gone through the questions from the first webinar, where is it more difficult or where is more resistance, Europe or China? And the audience said uh, China, all right. Every opinion is uh, valid, I would say, Europe because Asians or Chinese in the sense are more keen to change. It doesn't mean easier though. The education system has its flaws and this makes the lean implementation hard as well. What are the main differences regarding company structure? We have gone through four differences. How uh, Wufi works, how a joint venture works, how a state-owned company works and how a Chinese private-owned company works. And uh, the tagline from this is understand how things get done. What's the motivation behind? Yeah. For the Woofy, it's the long-term growth. For the state-owned company, it's I want everything yesterday. For the Chinese private-owned company, it's the return and invest thinking. And for the, uh, we have the third one is the joint venture. It's, yeah, it's the hidden agenda, I would say. Mm -hmm. Then how to improve behavior and mindset? The practical advice, just take it with you. One of these sentences and only one for one week and observe your own behavior and reflect on it and improve. Start with the three R's, replace, rethink, re-effect. Then the last point was the breakout session. To deepen understanding, why is my colleague acting like this? I hope this uh, is a starting point for you to shed light on this question <laughs> that you, yeah, the next time uh, not feel so strange anymore and that it may give you a clue for an answer yeah, why he behaved, he or she behaved this or this way. Yeah, and this is the summary of the second part of the webinar for today. And well, we would love to receive questions, but it's only two minutes left. No? Yes, thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, actually, Timo. Yeah. I think it was uh, very practical. The audience can get some, uh, some. They, they can have some homework now that they can uh, put in place in their in their company. So, so I hope they they grasp this uh, this practical uh, advice. And yes, you said yeah, like I, we have almost no time for questions, but I, I would like to ask you one: is if you can give us uh, some recommendations on how to reduce the resistance from the employees uh, when it's about to implement the lean, the lean strategies mm -hmm. in, in a company. Yeah, I would say the, the magic word is to connect yeah, on an eye-to-eye -eye level with your people. There are many ways to do it. No? I would not recommend the team dinner approach. This is something you have to do anyway. I would rather recommend be serious and sincere. Look into the eye of your colleague, subordinate, supervisor. Understand what's going on. Get a connection and once you have this connection there is no cultural barrier whatsoever which is standing in the way. You will have understanding for each other. You will accept each other. Yeah and work on this connection first. And the best way to get this connection actually is in the daily work, is in the meeting room. It's when the work is happening. Take it serious. Show your interest. Understand what's going on. Don't remote manage. Don't micromanage. Every person has an interest to share about the daily work and this is a starting point where you can connect. Mm -hmm. Okay, Timo, so yeah, it's been a pleasure to hear, hear you. Thanks a lot for this very interesting presentation. Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions. We will just uh, reply directly to the, to, the, 
to the and other I think company. We can yep. collect this question anyways. Now, if people have a question, yep. they can pull, push it here, and we put it into the memory box, yeah, and then maybe in some other webinar that will be addressed. No? Sure, sure. We'll reply them uh, directly. So, uh, yeah. Finally, I just want to close the the webinar, and I would like to remind you that the, actually the USME Center. On April 10th, we're going to have a cross-cultural communication and negotiation uh, training, training seminar. Actually, this is a payoff uh, a seminar that will be done here at the USME Center in Beijing. But, uh, I mean, we have very good trainers, one from China, one from Europe, and they, they give excellent excellent knowledge. And, and anyone that is interested in this training, please uh, have a look at our website. You can register there. So that's all for today. Thanks again, uh, Timo for this great presentation and thank everyone else for listening to us and we look forward to have you again in the next seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.